Hello, new Darktable user and or person who is dipping their toes in the water to see whether or not Darktable is going to be their new home for raw development. Either way, welcome. This video is going to be a quick introduction to getting up and running with Darktable. So let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 69 of Understanding Darktable. I'm going to assume that you are coming to Darktable from some other piece of similar software, whether it was Adobe Lightroom or Raw Therapy or Capture One or some other raw development engine. And given that assumption... I will further assume that you already understand the benefits of shooting RAW over JPEG, you understand bit depth, you understand color spaces, etc, etc. If you don't, I'm sure there are plenty of resources around YouTube that will help get you up to speed on those things. Now, I mentioned RAW and JPEG. Does that mean that you can't process your JPEG images in Darktable? No, absolutely not. If that's what you want to do, knock yourself out. But Darktable's strength is its raw processing power. The, uh, <laughs> not its raw power, but its, its ability to process raw files is what I'm trying to say. And if you've come from something like Adobe Lightroom, when you look at the interface of Darktable, you're going to go, man, they just stole the whole design off Lightroom. Well, maybe they did. Maybe it's just a very logical way to lay out this type of software. Uh, you will see in the top right hand corner the light table view. That is essentially your grid view where you view all of your images. And then you've got the dark room, which is where you process a single image at a time. And then under the other drop down menu, you have things like map, where you can drop images you've shot onto a map and then have geolocation metadata added to all of your images after the fact. It's fantastic if you then just want to see what images did I shoot in a certain country or in a certain town, whatever. Uh, the print module for when you want to print your images at home, the slideshow module if you want to run a slideshow, and a tethering module if you want to shoot tethered. Now, as much as I love Darktable, I will state right here at the risk of being shot by the developers that these four modules have not received quite the amount of love that the equivalent modules in something like Lightroom have received. Adobe has an actual budget where it can pay developers to develop that stuff. Darktable is all done by you know a team of guys around the world who are all working on this for no pay so you know those features work but they're maybe not quite as polished as what you might be used to in some other applications so for the purposes of this video we are just going to focus on the light table view and the dark room view because in terms of getting your images in doing some development and then exporting you know a jpeg or a png it's only the light table and the dark room that you're going to need all right, where to start? As I'm recording this, we are using Darktable 3.2.1, which is the current stable release, uh, as I'm recording this in September of 2020. If you're new to the Darktable world, I will let you in on a little secret. Every Christmas day, there is a new stable release of Darktable. So there will be a new stable release on the 25th of December 2020. And in most years, there is one stable release per year, and it happens on, at Christmas Day. There are occasionally dot releases over the course of the year if certain new things are deemed to be warranted to justify a dot release, then those things will happen. But generally, there is one stable release per year. As it happens, 2020 was a bit of an anomaly. The devs worked on some fantastic stuff between Christmas of 2019 and uh, probably about March. 
Uh, and around March, they said, you know what, we're going to do another stable release in August. Uh, so just six weeks ago, we got version 3.2.1. Uh, as a new stable release, that was an anomaly. Now, to get your images into Darktable, you need to be in the Lighttable view. And if you've just launched Darktable for the first time after install, this was this is where you will be. You'll be in the Lighttable view. In the top left-hand corner, you will see the Import dialog uh, or module. And within that module, you will see there is a button for Image and a button for Folder. I'm going to bring up the folder import dialog because it is identical to the image import dialog with the exception of a couple of things. Basically, if you choose image, it will allow you to import a single image or a range of images within one particular location on your file system. You know, generally that's a folder. If we go with the folder option, then you cannot just select an image. You have to select a folder. And in this instance, I've got a couple of raw files and a JPEG that I shot yesterday of my new motorcycle. We're going to use those as guinea pig images for this particular episode. So what we would do is we would go back so that we are looking at the folder level and we would select the folder that we want to import. Now, before I do that, the two things that you will find in this import folder dialog box that you won't find in the import image dialog box are these two things here. Import folders recursively and ignore JPEG files. Now, the reason for that is that if you've clicked on import image, Ignore JPEG files is something you're going to do manually with your mouse. If you only wanted to import the RAWs, then you would only select the RAW files. So there was no need to have that ignore JPEG files option. Import folders recursively means that if you have a parent folder that might be called photos, and then inside that you have a bunch of child folders that maybe they're named by date, which is the way I work. Maybe you name your folders according to what the shoot was. By having this box ticked, you can select the parent folder, photos, and then click on open. And what Darktable will do is it will read all of the folders recursively. So it will read all of the child file folders and wherever it finds image files in any format, RAW, JPEG, TIFF, PNG, whatever, it will import all of them. On top of that, you have the ability to apply metadata on import. And you can choose to uncheck things that maybe already existed, like maybe you set a description within your camera. So that metadata got written to the images in camera at the time of capture and you don't want to overwrite that information so you would uncheck those boxes so that those fields don't get overwritten and then you might just check the ones that you want to include you can also include you know basic tags so if the folder that you're about to import contains let's say you just went and shot a wedding and it's Dave and Susie's wedding. So you might put Dave and Susie's weddings in the tags and then that tag will be applied to every image that you've imported. Just saves you from having to go and do it later. If you're new to this channel, you're new to me, one thing you'll learn about me is I am manic about tagging my images all of the time. If you haven't yet started doing it, I implore you, just start today. Even if you've already got 10,000 images and you think that is a mountain that I am just never going to get over, doesn't matter. Just start tagging images from today. One day you will thank me, believe me. Anyway, we are going to import this folder. But before we do that, I just want to show you what's in that folder. There are two raw files and one of the in-camera JPEGs. I didn't bother keeping them all. 
but that's all that's in that folder at this point in time. So we come in here and we click on open. And what we've got is those three images in the light table view. And as you will see, up in the top left hand corner of the thumbnail is a description of the file type. So my raw files, which were so shot on a Sony Alpha, are ARW for Alpha RAW, and the JPEG has JPG. Now, all of these other modules that appear in the light table view, I've already done videos on what they do. So I'm not gonna get into the weeds in this video. I'm just gonna say, search my channel, you will find there is a dedicated video for pretty much every module in Darktable. And if you need more background on how a particular module works or more of the hidden features that you might not intuitively know, go and check out the relevant video. If we want to process one of these images, we would simply double click and we would go into the dark room just like in Adobe Lightroom. Before we do that, I just want to show you something else. If we go back to the file manager, we can see that at the time that we imported our images into Darktable, Darktable created an XMP file alongside every image file. Now, I know that there are people who get all bent out of shape because their image folders are suddenly populated with all these XMP files. I am going to say to you, please get over it. Those XMP files are going to save your butt one day. What happens is everything you do to an image in Darktable, either through the light table view in terms of you know adding metadata adding tags geotagging all of that kind of stuff and then all of the stuff you do in the dark room where you know you change white balance you add tone curves you add contrast saturation whatever all of those things that you do they get saved into these xmp sidecar files now if you are coming from Adobe Lightroom, let me share a little story with you. Adobe doesn't do this by default, or at least it didn't the last time I was working with Lightroom, which was 2016. What Lightroom always does is store all of that information in a .lr cat file, your Lightroom catalog file. And if you don't have backups activated, and something corrupts your LR cat file, like the application were to crash and the LR cat file didn't get closed properly, guess what? You're toast. You just lost everything you ever did in Lightroom. And okay, user error on my part for not having backups enabled, but that happened to me. And I lost every edit on every single image I had ever worked on in Adobe Lightroom. Now, I fully own the mistake because I didn't have the backup feature enabled in Lightroom to back up my LR cat file. And it was simply because those LR cat files, they get freaking huge because they're holding every edit for every image. So it's all your eggs in one basket. Hello? The beauty of Darktable, in my opinion, is that there is no eggs all in one basket thing. It's, you know, each image has its own XMP file, which is basically like its own miniature LR cat file per image. Now, let me demonstrate something. Let's just double click on this image. This is the image pretty much by default, straight out of the camera. And it's color. So let's just make it monochrome, just because we can. Let's do something stupid, like create a really horrible tone curve to it. 
And if we go back to the light table, we can now see that the thumbnail reflects those changes. Now, I'm about to demonstrate why I love the concept of the XMP sidecar files. If I go into the selected images module and I select remove, and I go yes, that image has been removed from dark table, but it has not been removed from my file system. If I wanted to trash the image, I would have clicked on trash and that will actually delete the file from your file system as well. If you just want to remove it from dark table, you use remove. Now we go back over to that folder and we can see that the XMP files are still there along with the image files. If something happened to my copy of Darktable, let's say, you know, something got corrupted somehow. And I've got to say, it's a really stable app. The only time it's ever crashed for me, it's when I've done something stupid, you know, under the hood. Uh, I've, I don't think it's ever crashed just from general usage. The great thing is, is that if something went wrong, Let's say your entire system got corrupted and you had to reinstall Darktable. You could go and re-import that image. Now, sure, this thumbnail here is still showing us the default view of that raw file. It's not showing me the adjustments that I made in the darkroom because it's not reading the XMP file yet. It's just looking at the raw file. If I open that up, voila, all of the changes were written in the XMP file. And because the XMP file was still sitting alongside the image file, all of the changes that I had made to this image have been retained. And that, to me, is worth its weight in gold. So I could install Darktable on my laptop and I could then copy all of the images and the XMP files that were in this folder onto a USB key, put the USB key into my laptop, import the images into Darktable on my laptop, and all of the edits that I've made are going to come with it because they're all stored in the XMP files. So for those people who have an issue with the XMP files, you know, cluttering up your image directories, again, I would say, get over it. They are your friend. They really are. Okay. So we want to get into processing our images. When you have an instance of a RAW and JPEG, so they were shot in camera like that, where I had the camera set to shoot RAW plus JPEG, Darktable will automatically put a yellow box around this image pair to show you that they are grouped because they came in together. Yeah, they are a pair of images. You can group and ungroup images for yourself. And again, I've covered that in another video. Now, if we jump into the JPEG in the darkroom view and we look at the history stack, you are going to see that there is already a handful of history items. We have the original image, then an input color profile, an output color profile, a display encoding, and an orientation. And again, I know that there are people who come to Darktable and go, why are all these things being done to my image? My image should be original state only. Well, again, chill, guys. All of these things are being done in whatever software you've been using up until now, they just didn't show you that they were doing those things. Particularly, and we'll, we'll get to the raw file in a minute, but when you look at the raw file, there's even more things done by default. And again, all of those things are done in every other piece of software. The great thing about Darktable, I, I liken Darktable to, you know, a high-end sports car that has a clear hood over the engine so you can look in and you can see the engine. It's basically like that. You're seeing all of the things that Darktable does. The other software does it. They just don't show you those things. Now, you might say, well, why bother showing me if they're being done? 
Well, because you can go and change some of those values, but all of those steps have to happen, right? If we go to the active modules tab here, we can see that there is orientation. And orientation is simply Darktable reading the metadata from the camera that said, was this image shot in a landscape orientation or was it shot in a portrait orientation? That's all that is. Okay, I've noticed with my really old digital camera from like 10, 15 years ago, some of the default orientations are upside down. So if I ever want to process those images, I do actually have to go back into the orientation module and I have to click twice, either clockwise or anti-clockwise, <laughs> to rotate them round to the right way up. It doesn't bother me because I very rarely go back to images that are that old, but just understand that that module is just reading that metadata from your camera uh, pertaining to which orientation the camera was in at the time of capture. Your input color profile usually will be standard color metrics. In this instance, it's saying Adobe RGB because, oops, didn't mean to do that, because Adobe RGB is what I've got my camera set to shoot. So again, Darktable is simply reading that information from the metadata that came from the camera. And it realizes that, oh, the camera stored this with an Adobe RGB profile, so that's what we'll use as an input profile. But if for some reason you want to come in and choose a different input profile, you can do it. But understand that that's always going to be part of your history stack. You can't get rid of it. Now, if we go to the raw file, there's a whole bunch more stuff happening, okay? We've gotten from original to raw black and white point, demosaic, input color profile, output color profile, display encoding, white balance, highlight reconstruction, and that's where things change. Let's just address these first eight steps first, okay? Again, Whatever software you have been using in the past, it was doing all of this stuff. It just wasn't showing you. Like I said, the clear see-through hood, right? Darktable just shows you everything that it's doing. And most of those things you can go in and tweak, and they will then appear as a new history item. Now, I said only up to step seven here. The reason... I haven't addressed the next couple of things, filmic RGB and exposure, is because that comes down to one of the preferences for Darktable. So preferences can be accessed via this cog icon in the top right-hand corner here. Click on that. And if we go to the processing tab, and I covered this in a fair amount of detail only two or three videos back in the playlist. If you uh, go to my channel, uh, look for the video on Filmic V4. Uh, I think it's, I think it was maybe episode 65 or 66, I'd guess. Uh, I go into this in quite a lot of detail. By default, when you install Darktable, the default pixel workflow is going to be display referred. And what that means is that Darktable will default to using modules like base curve and a few other things that work in the lab color space. And lab is a logarithmic workspace. One of the developers of Darktable, Aurelian Pierre, who was the guy who wrote the filmic RGB module, believes that we really should be working in linear color spaces, not logarithmic color spaces. He has his reasons for that, uh, and you will find links to his stuff when you watch the filmic uh, video of mine. I do include a link to Aurelian's video. It's quite dry, it's very technical, it's pretty heavy going, uh, but he does lay out his reasoning for why he believes we should work in a linear color space, not a logarithmic color space. And when you choose scene referred as the default, 
and it will require a restarting of Darktable if you do change uh, that preference. What will happen is that Filmic, RGB and Exposure will then be applied to every raw image that you import. Now, one thing to note is that it will not do that to images that you've already imported into Darktable. If you've already imported them, you will need to remove them from Darktable, delete the XMP sidecar files, and then re-import. Now, that means you're going to lose any edits you've done on those files, but it will mean that if you import those images again and there is no XMP sidecar file sitting on the file system alongside the image file, then they will be imported with Filmic RGB and Exposure added. If you're happy with all of your old images and you simply want to change to the scene referred workflow moving forward, then you can simply change that preference, close Darktable, restart it, and any images you import thereafter will get filmic and exposure applied. And I do recommend you go and watch the filmic RGB or filmic V4 video to come up to speed on how that works, why it does what it does, and what it's designed to do. The intent is to try and give your raw files a view on your computer monitor that is close to, it's never going to be 100% perfect, but close to the way the in-camera JPEG looked. Now, like I said, it's not going to be a perfect match, but that's what its intent is. Now, again, I know some people get really worked up about the raw file in Darktable not looking exactly like the JPEG. And I kind of scratch my head at that because when are you ever going to show somebody, you know, some third party, the raw file that you processed in Darktable alongside the in-camera JPEG, right? It's like you're worried that some person is going to go, oh, your raw doesn't look anywhere near as good as the in-camera JPEG. Like, when is that ever going to happen? Never, right? So I don't understand why some people have such a bug up their butt over the raw file not looking exactly like the in-camera JPEG. Anyway, each to their own. So all of these things are happening to the raw file the moment it's imported into Darktable. Just get over it. They're always going to be there, okay? Like I said, the clear see-through hood. You get to see everything that's going on. And with some of those things, you can go in and change values by going to the Active Modules tab because this will show you all of the modules that have been activated by default. Which brings me to the next thing that new users to Darktable need to understand. Darktable has always, right from the outset, like any other piece of imaging software, allowed you to activate modules in whatever order you want to activate them. You know, I generally will start with making sure that the white balance is right, and then I'll probably start on tone curves and maybe some contrast adjustments and saturation and whatever. Whatever order you want to apply them in is entirely up to you. But Darktable has always applied modules in a certain order. So when you look at the active modules tab here, the one with the power button, what you are seeing is the order of the pixel pipe, as it's called in Darktable parlance, from the beginning and because it's a raw file, then the very first thing will always be the raw black and white point. 
then it goes to white balance, then it goes to highlight reconstruction, then demosaic, blah, 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 all the way up to the top, right? It always works in the order they are displayed in this active modules tab. That is the order in which everything is applied. So you could do everything you want to do to your image and get it absolutely looking the way you like. And then right at the end, you think to yourself, hmm, I think I want to tweak that white balance just a little bit. That's fine. You can adjust the white balance a little bit. But even though it was the last thing you did, it still gets applied at this point in the pixel pipeline. It doesn't magically move white balance right up here to above output color profile. It still happens in this order. And that is, again, something that new users seem to struggle with. I don't know why. I think if you've worked in something like Photoshop or GIMP, where everything you do happens in a set sequence, then, you know, people seem to think, oh, well, if I'm developing RAW, it should work in the same way. No, it doesn't. The order in which certain modules slot into that pixel pipeline has been given a lot of care and consideration by the developers. Now, having said all of that, Christmas 2019, we saw the release of Darktable 3. And with the release of Darktable 3 came the option to change the order in which the modules were applied in the Pixel Pipeline, simply because so many people requested it. And as I said in the new features video for Darktable 3 that I put out back then, I don't even remember what episode number that was, unless you, A, have a really valid reason for it, and B, understand the potential pitfalls, just don't do it. Just don't, right? It's all fun and games until someone loses an eye, <laughs> okay? Unless you really got a reason for it and you understand, just don't even bother. Uh, and I'm not going to explain how to do it here. If you really need to know, go check out the new features video for Darktable 3 where I cover how to change the order of the modules. But really, you don't need to do it. Like I said, a lot of care and attention has gone into the order in which modules are applied and... Unless you think you know better, yeah, just don't. All right, so we've got our image and we now decide we want to do something with it. Maybe we want to crop the image. So I would go to my crop tab, uh, my crop module. And okay, so the last thing I was doing was cranking out 16 by 9 aspect ratio images. But I might decide I want to just go freehand so I can crop this any way I want. I can now change the crop, get rid of all that crud on the right-hand side that's not really adding to the image. I'll just crop in a little bit on the left. Might give it a little bit more space at the bottom. I'm happy with that. Double-click, and there's my new crop. Okay, in terms of the various modules that you can use inside Darktable, it can be pretty overwhelming for a new user because there's something like 70 modules in Darktable. And if you click again so that none of these tabs is actually highlighted, you'll actually be looking at pretty... Oh, maybe it's not 70. I don't know. Or maybe that's not showing everything. Ah, no. It's just showing the ones I've got view viewable. So... Down here in the bottom right-hand corner, you will find a button called More Modules. When you click on that, you will see that some of these are highlighted with a light gray bar and some of them are dark. The ones that are dark are not visible in my current setup. But there is a third setting and that is, let's find one, one like Crop and Rotate that has 
a little star icon beside it. And what that means is I have made that a favorite, which means it appears in this second group up here, which is my favorite modules. Now, what I would suggest as a new user is that you come into the hamburger icon alongside the more modules button and select subset no module. And what that's going to do is turn off every single module. And what I would do is I would turn on the basic adjustments module and maybe the white balance module and any other modules, you know, scroll through the list. If you've worked in other software like this, you will recognize names and you'll go, oh yeah, I want that module to be visible. But just start with a very small subset. Maybe you want contrast and saturation. Maybe you want an RGB tone curve. You know, the crop and rotate module you're probably going to want. Just pick, you know, four or five modules that you know you are going to want and then just collapse that menu. So now you've got rid of all of the clutter. Now you've just got the very basics and this basic adjustments module, this was new with Darktable 3 and it is designed to give you, as the name suggests, the basic adjustments that nine times out of 10 are the things you are going to want. You know, black level correction, exposure, a bit of highlight compression, some contrast, a middle gray adjustment, brightness, saturation, and vibrance. Okay, that's the basics. Get started with that. Just until you get comfortable moving around in Darktable, use those, you know, and like I said, whether you're working on RAWs or JPEG, that's entirely up to you. And once you have got your image looking the way you want it to look, and you're then ready to create an exported version, maybe as a JPEG, you, know, you want to throw it on Instagram or Facebook, or you want to email it to somebody, you would then go back to the light table, select the image, so this is our image that is now cropped. Go to the Export Selected tab. And here you will create all of the, well, all of the things like where you want to export it to, the format you want to export it as, the size you want to export. You know, if you're shooting with a 42 megapixel camera, you probably don't want your JPEG to be exported at full resolution. You probably want something a bit smaller if you're just wanting to put it on Instagram or Facebook. So all of those criteria you can enter into here. And again, go to the hamburger icon and you can store a preset that you can then recall whenever you want. And as you can see, you know, I have a preset for when I want to post stuff to Facebook. I have a preset for when I want to export for Instagram. I have presets for the images I want to throw on my phone. Uh, things like retouch, I have the, no size values put in there. So they are exporting at the native size of my raw images, which in my case is 24 megapixels. So if I do want to go out to either GIMP because I want to do some multi-layer stuff or maybe I want to export a sequence of images that I'm going to stitch in Hugen into a multi-image panorama. I want those to just export at full resolution. So I have a preset for exactly that purpose. Right, so create whatever values you need in here to export your image and when you're ready, you can click on export. Now, the only other thing I will say is that to the right of the export button is this little cog icon, and that will allow you to include or omit certain metadata from the image at the time of export. Now, the reason you might want to use that is, let's say within Darktable, you've created quite extensive tags on 
may be the names of the people who are in certain images. I certainly do that. And I know, yes, that might seem really anal, but that's just me. I love being able to search for, you know, people in an image or whatever. But the image you export for Instagram or Facebook, you might want to protect the privacy of those people and so not include that metadata. So you can choose to keep certain keywords or metadata out of those images. Let's say the geotags. You might have taken the images that you shot in your home and you might have tagged them using the maps module but you don't want everyone to know where you live. So you could exclude the geotags metadata at the time of export. Okay, so again, you can choose to save all of that according to what suits your aesthetic and then export your images. Okay, so I haven't really shown you any developing stuff because... That's what the other 60-odd episodes of this channel have covered. If you want to know how a tone curve module works, go check out that video. There will be plenty of videos for you to spend hours on. Uh, but like I said, I'm assuming you've come from some other piece of software and you therefore understand the basics of image editing and that you really just want to know how to get an image into Darktable, how to process it, how to export it. And hopefully, I've covered that for you. All right, so if you are new to Darktable, hopefully this has given you the basics. I know it's probably a lot longer than you wanted, but hopefully it's brought you up to speed on how Darktable works and some of the underlying assumptions and basic workflow concepts that this application uses. If you love the channel, please consider subscribing. Uh, I also have a Patreon. You will see the link down the bottom uh, on the screen at some point in this video. Uh, and to my patrons, again, thank you for your continued support. And I will catch you in the next one.